I've got something really special to show you now about what Shakespeare can do to show us what's going on with a character by messing with the scansion of their verse lines. This episode is going to be entirely devoted to step four of my process, marking up the scansion. So it's best if you go and get yourself a pencil and probably an eraser and a copy of the play and get ready to get really hardcore technical. Unfortunately, what that means is the super famous subplot of this play is going to be completely neglected. I'm so sorry, Malvolio and your comic compatriots, but you do speak in prose, so we're not going to have the chance to look at you and your yellow garters today. Because of the prominence of that Malvolio plot, Twelfth Night is perhaps surprisingly 60% prose and only 40% verse, so it's that 40% we're going to be hanging out in here. One of the most eye-opening things you can do with this play is take a close look scene by scene at where the shifts happen from when someone's speaking prose to when they're speaking verse and back again. But first of all, let's spend some time with the verse. What I'm going to do now is demonstrate the process of figuring out the scansion of a line, working out which beats are light and which are heavy. So at the end of that, we can say the line in such a way that we can figure out what matters in it. Remember, what we're looking for as the standard, as the default, is that there are going to be 10 syllables in the line, and five of those, every second one in most cases, is going to be a heavy beat. So that light heavy, light heavy pattern that we call iambic is what we're going to be looking for, and along the way we're going to find some variations where that isn't what we get. A one-line example to begin, just to show what you do to put the marks down on the page. Let's try a speech that might be a little unexpected, but is actually a really wonderful one to look into this play's layers and layers of fascination with misplaced desire, desire that cannot speak its name. And let's try Antonio's speech to Sebastian about why he followed him, um, because his confidence for why he must do what he must do comes out in the scansion of his lines, which is how these things work. So remember, um, little cups for light beats and sources for heavy beats. Here we go. Light, heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy. Now, it might seem a little strange for a light to be on you, but let's see how it works with the rest of the sentence. Heavy, light, heavy. So all I've done is I've marked alternate light and heavy beats across each syllable in this 10-syllable line. Let's see how it works now. I could not stay behind you, my desire. So even though it looks like you would most likely be the focus of the speech. Um, the fact that it is a light beat in the middle of this line actually pushes you on to what really matters more, which is this phrase, my desire. Now let's get a little more ambitious and look at a short speech of Orsino's in Act 2, Scene 4. This passage is a perfect tiny little case study for us because it has the right number of quirks in it that means we can demonstrate the choices that you have to be constantly making as you mark up a passage of verse to find the meter. So let's start with the first decision, this opening line in Orsino's speech, let all the rest give place, once more Cesario. Now, the choice there is, are these two short lines or are they a single split line? I'm inclined to think it makes more sense to see them as two short lines because of the action that has to take in between, which is everyone except Orsino and Cesario leaving the room. And if we decide that, it becomes very simple. Let all the rest give place. De da de da de da It's very iambic. Then once, gap for activity, once more, 
Cesario, and we can say the full Cesario that way because we're not trying to cram it in to, to make it uh, fit a single line. So we can say Cesario and give full weight to the name instead of uh, trying to make it into two syllables, Cesario. So now we get to the important bit, the bit where Orsino is talking again about Olivia. Let's see what weight the scansion gives certain moments and thoughts, what breathing happens in this space that we can find by figuring out where the stressed beats fall. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Now cruelty here is our next decision we have to make because we might normally give it two syllables and say cruelty. But if we give it three, cruelty, uh, then that makes this line a perfectly standard even iambic pentameter. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. And what that gives us is the heaviness and weight that a world like a word like cruelty actually requires in the way Orsino is seeing his position as a tragic hero. Let's keep going. Tell her my love more noble than the world. So that is a really straightforward line, no quirks in there, just five stressed beats giving us an even iambic pentameter. Prizes not quantity of dirty lands. Now this one's all over the place. Suddenly we've got a bunch of decisions to make. Um, let's say that we have a trochaic reversal at the beginning and it's a uh, heavy, light, light, heavy. So to know that you've got that at the beginning of a line, it's a really common thing to see at the beginning of the line. And if you can say to yourself rat-a-tat-tat, then what you're seeing is a, an iambic reversal at the start of a line. Prizes not quantity of dirty land. So if we do that, if we decide that's how the line begins, then once again, it fits the pentameter beautifully evenly and we finish on a heavy beat with land. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her. So that is our first feminine ending because uh, at the end of upon, uh, upon we have our final heavy fifth stressed beat, upon, but then there's this next word, her, which by right should be a light beat at the end, and that's what we call a feminine ending. It simply has an extra syllable at the end of the line, which will be treated as a light beat. Tell her I hold as gid Giddily as fortune. Giddily as fortune. I think we'll uh, treat giddily as three beats here. Giddily, because that makes it as light, which seems right, and four as heavy, and that just gives us another feminine ending. So with two feminine endings in a row, we're starting to get the feeling that Orsino is um, starting to be a little less certain he's drifting off or he's um, tripping around in his mind. There's an instability that's produced when you hear several feminine endings in a row. But tis that miracle and queen of gems. So another very even one with some beautiful long vowels on the heavy beats, queen of gems, that nature pranks her in, attracts my soul. So you see we're back in that last couple of lines into the very even pentameters, which allows those heavy beats allow the large long vowels to really give weight and breath and space attracts my soul 
and that's how you mark up a short passage of verse and make some of the decisions that you have to make about how to how and where to play with the meter to make everything fit. Next time in the last of our three episodes on Twelfth Night, we'll take what you now know about marking up the scansion and we'll talk less about the techniques and more about what meaning it gives us and the insights into the characters and their feelings. <laughs>